Thank you, Lori. Uh, just, again, another reminder of, of the importance of what we do in, in thought and in deed and in action. Uh, that it is about impacting those. And what I love was about the fact that the miracles may come in different forms. It may not be a healing, but what it may be is an opportunity to use the story that God has blessed you with in some different kind of package than what we might call blessing, but to still reach others for the kingdom. So I'm going to begin today in a little bit different way than I have before. I'm going to read a book. Okay, so uh, the book is entitled The Tale of the Three Trees, and sorry, I don't own the book, so I couldn't put the words up on the screen, but if you're not familiar with, the, with this story, it is a great story. Once there were three trees on a mountaintop. They were discussing their hopes and dreams when the first tree said, someday I hope to be a treasure chest. I would be filled with gold, silver, and precious gems. I could be decorated with intricate carvings, and everyone would see my beauty. Then the, tre the second tree said, Someday I will be a mighty ship. I will take kings and queens across the seas and sail to the corners of the earth. Everyone will feel safe in me because of the strength of my hull. Finally, the third tree said, I want to grow to be the tallest and straightest tree in the forest. People will see me on top of the hill and will look up at my branches and think of the heavens and how close I am to reaching them. I will be the greatest tree of all time, and people will always remember me. After a few years of praying that their dreams would come true, a group of woodcutters came upon the trees. When one of them came to the first tree, he said, This looks like a strong tree. I do think that I would be able to sell this tree to a carpenter. And he began to cut the tree down. The tree was very happy because he knew that a carpenter could make him into a treasure chest for precious gems and metals. At the second tree, another woodcutter said, This looks like a strong tree too. I should be able to sell this ship with this tree to a shipyard. The second tree was even more happy than the first because he knew that he was on his way to becoming a mighty ship. When the woodcutter saw the third tree, the tree was frightened because he heard the woodcutter say, I have no special need for this tree. I'll just cut it down and see later if I will have any need for it. The third tree thought that his dreams would not come true. But when the first tree arrived at the carpenters, he was made into a feed box for animals. He was then placed in a barn and filled with hay. This was not what the first tree had dreamed of or prayed for, and he was very disappointed. The second tree went to the shipyard and was made into a small fishing boat. His dreams of being a mighty ship, carrying kings and queens across the seas, was ended. The third tree was cut up into planks and was left alone in the darkness. Many years went by and all three trees forgot about their dreams and prayers. Then one day, a man and a woman came to the barn to stay for a while. She gave birth to a baby boy while she was there and she placed the baby boy in the hay in the feed box. The man wished he could have made a proper crib for the baby but this feed box would have to do. But somehow the first tree felt the importance of this event and somehow knew that he had indeed held the greatest treasure of all time. Some years later, a group of men got into a small fishing boat made from the timber of the second tree. One of them was tired and fell asleep. While they were out on the water, a great storm came up and the second Thank you, Lori. Uh, just, again, another reminder of, of the importance of what we do in, in thought and in deed and in action. Uh, that it is about impacting those. And what I love was about the fact that the miracles may come in different forms. It may not be a healing, 
But what it may be is an opportunity to use the story that God has blessed you with in some different kind of package than what we might call blessing, but to still reach others for the kingdom. So I'm going to begin today in a little bit different way than I have before. I'm going to read a book. Okay, so uh, the book is entitled The Tale of the Three Trees, and sorry, I don't own the book, so I couldn't put the words up on the screen, but if you're not familiar with, the, with this story, it is a great story. Once there were three trees on a mountaintop. They were discussing their hopes and dreams when the first tree said, someday I hope to be a treasure chest. I would be filled with gold, silver, and precious gems. I could be decorated with intricate carvings, and everyone would see my beauty. Then the, tre the second tree said, Someday I will be a mighty ship. I will take kings and queens across the seas and sail to the corners of the earth. Everyone will feel safe in me because of the strength of my hull. Finally, the third tree said, I want to grow to be the tallest and straightest tree in the forest. People will see me on top of the hill and will look up at my branches and think of the heavens and how close I am to reaching them. I will be the greatest tree of all time, and people will always remember me. After a few years of praying that their dreams would come true, a group of woodcutters came upon the trees. When one of them came to the first tree, he said, This looks like a strong tree. I do think that I would be able to sell this tree to a carpenter. And he began to cut the tree down. The tree was very happy because he knew that a carpenter could make him into a treasure chest for precious gems and metals. At the second tree, another woodcutter said, This looks like a strong tree too. I should be able to sell this ship or this tree to a shipyard. The second tree was even more happy than the first because he knew that he was on his way to becoming a mighty ship. When the woodcutter saw the third tree, the tree was frightened because he heard the woodcutter say, I have no special need for this tree. I'll just cut it down and see later if I will have any need for it. The third tree thought that his dreams would not come true. But when the first tree arrived at the carpenters, he was made into a feed box for animals. He was then placed in a barn and filled with hay. This was not what the first tree had dreamed of or prayed for, and he was very disappointed. The second tree went to the shipyard and was made into a small fishing boat. His dreams of being a mighty ship, carrying kings and queens across the seas, was ended. The third tree was cut up into planks and was left alone in the darkness. Many years went by, and all three trees forgot about their dreams and prayers. Then one day, a man and a woman came to the barn to stay for a while. She gave birth to a baby boy while she was there, and she placed the baby boy in the hay in the feed box. The man wished he could have made a proper crib for the baby, but this feed box would have to do. But somehow, the first tree felt the importance of this event, and somehow knew that he had indeed held the greatest treasure of all time. Some years later, a group of men got into a small fishing boat made from the timber of the second tree. One of them was tired and fell asleep. While they were out on the water, a great storm came up and the sun strong enough to keep the men safe. The other men in the fishing boat then woke the man who was asleep, and he said, Peace! And the storm suddenly stopped. Now the tree knew that he had indeed carried the king of kings. Finally, some three years later, someone came and got the third tree planks out of the dark shed. It was carried through the streets as the people, as the people mocked the man who was carrying it. When they came to stop on a small hill, the man was nailed to the tree and raised in the air to die there. 
On the Sunday, the third tree suddenly came to realize that it was indeed strong enough to stand on the top of a hill for all to see, and that he was closer to heaven than he could have ever imagined. That was better than being the tallest tree in the world. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. And it will be here on the screen. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? So what is it about the future that causes you anxiety? Likely, you can think of some of the fears of the future that you see up here that maybe you have. Even if they're on a personal level, not necessarily a global scale. Maybe you have more that are not up here that you face. Here is my sermon in a sentence this week. The root of our fear of the future, which dates back to the Garden of Eden, is a distrust of God. First, when we live with a fear of the future, we doubt the goodness of God. Implicit in doubt, doubting God's goodness is the reality that we think we have a better plan if we were in charge, that somehow our lives would be different and more fulfilling. I'm going to do something else a little different. I'm going to play an interactive game with you for just a second. So this requires hands being raised if you think it's true, and just leave your hands at your side if you think it is false. Okay, there are four questions here. First, or first four statements. Iran and Afghanistan are the fastest growing, have the fastest rate of growth of Christianity. Raise your hand if you think it's true. Keep your hand down if you think it's false. Okay, the answer is true. 19.6% and 16.7%. Number two, more than 80% of unchurched people would attend if they were invited by someone they know. True or false? 83%. True. Number three, 30% of churchgoers invited an unchurched person to church in the last year. A lot of false. Higher? Lower? 2%. 2%. And last, while our First Amendment rights were being violated with the forced closings of churches, church attendance decreased by 43%. True or false? Okay, a lot of falses. What do we think? Increased? Decreased? Increased. It increased by 43%. So while we may be fretting, thank you for playing along, by the way. I'm, this is my, uh, my opportunity to interview for potential uh, job, or uh, game show hosts. So <laughs> I'm not going to do very well. I think, my, I think I'll be invited back here at least one more week. So, <laughs> so while we might be fretting, the persecution that we maybe see in our land, which, by the way, those of us here in the persecution really looks like. We haven't experienced it like, it like it's coming and like it has been in places and is in places. But God says, in the midst of our fear of persecution, I am sifting up the hearts of men and women as a result of the persecution. Here's a quote from an, a pastor or a church leader in Iran. Efforts by the Ayatollahs to destroy Christianity have backfired. They have served to refine and purify the church. What persecution did was, was destroy the church that were not disciples 
and destroyed a church that were all about converts. All these church planters found out was that converts run away from persecution. Disciples will die for their faith. While we are consumed with this pandemic, God is at work drawing back his people and separating out the wheat from the chaff. 83%, and this is a number I have seen over and over again from different surveys, 83% of those within our communities would come to church if we invited them. And yet 2% of us, if we are statistically the norm, have invited people recently to come to church. We don't have the will to even engage our communities at times. So let me be clear. The issue is not the goodness of God. It's an issue with our faithfulness. These statistics are an indictment about our desire to cling to some false belief at some level that we know what is best for ourselves and for our world. And that there's no real need for God. Why do we struggle to give up control in areas of our lives? It's because if we know, if we do, deep down we understand that that means we no longer have the opportunity or the ability or the right to say, I can do whatever I want. Because God is in control. Truth exists, right and wrong exist. We reveal that our love for whatever fears we face or whatever sins that we are entangled in are greater than our love for God. And while it is good and perfectly fine to seek to understand why things are happening, to try to understand why tragedies show up, we must remember that it is not because God isn't good. We often base God's goodness upon what happens in our lives based on what we think should happen, what we believe should happen. Yes, if we find ourselves doubting God, it's probably because we're in a, in a precarious situation, but we need to understand God is God. Remember that guy Job, who I've been kind of using a lot recently, and a guy that dealt with a lot of trials. Remember that when Job gets to a point in his life where he is doubting God's goodness, how does God respond? He doesn't explain all of the tragedies and why they're happening. He simply says, and powerfully says, I am God, and you are not. God is pointing to the fact that when we doubt God's goodness, underneath it all, we believe we are a better God than he is. Acknowledging that God is God means that we are able to willingly submit to what he has for us because we know it is for our good. Again, it's perfectly okay to ask why God does what he does and why things are happening. But only if you can say this, I do not occupy myself with things too great and marvelous for me. When we doubt the goodness of God, when we believe our ways are better than his, and they're more fulfilling, God calls us to taste and see that my word, or his word, is good. Where we deserve punishment, God shows mercy. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures for ourselves in the midst of trials. Or incapable of that we are incapable of overcoming on our own. We are reminded that the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. We are constantly bombarded with what we can do differently to live a good and fulfilling life. You don't have to look around very far. But the only path to a truly good and fulfilling life is one serving the Messiah. 
Secondly, when we fear the future, we doubt the love of God. How great the Father's love that he has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for our friends. While the emotion-based love of man grows cold quick, we can be thankful that God stays the, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Because of God's infinite love, he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. His love for us runs so deep that God shows his love for us even while we were still sinners, he died for us. God loves us so much that we need not spend the time worrying about our needs and how they will be met. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 reminds us that by his divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Yet when we see how quickly the love of those around us ebbs and flows, we can't help but to transfer this to God. Even believing at times that God's love has been withdrawn from us because things aren't going the way we think they should. We rightly understand God's perfect love for us when our peace about the future does not depend on getting our way. Because he loves us more than we can even love ourselves. Thirdly, when we live with a fear of the future, we doubt the truthfulness of God. I can hear the hiss of the serpent in Genesis. He, as he told Adam and Eve, Did God really say, You will not die, but you will be like God? The seed was being planted to doubt God's truthfulness. We need to hear and allow the truthfulness of the word of God to permeate our entire being. Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. We need to reconsider whether or not the Bible or the Word of God rules in our lives. And where we maybe have a claim some unbiblical beliefs to be our truth. Let's, let's face it. We are bombarded with things that, that sound Christianese, to use that word, that, that don't align with Scripture. I remember a great many things that I was taught as a kid, and as I've learned and studied scripture on my own, I think, where did these teachings come from? And these are teachings that, are being, that were being taught within the church. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 6 says, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Rather than doubt the truthfulness of God's word, when we are in fear, we must first examine in what or in whom our trust is placed. There is no truth apart from God's. Psalm 119 says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endure forever. Truth apart from God do you really think you're the first person to try that? Or that yours is the path of wisdom? The path to destruction is wide. The path, I'm sorry, the path to destruction is wide and often tried. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. How can we learn to trust in God if we have not examined his word, if we have not studied his word? 
We cannot. Man's way is to seek truth through our feelings, through our experiences, and through our thoughts. And each of these will lead to death. It is, it is the truth taught by Jesus that overcomes our fears. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. He said, Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set, me, will set you free. He alone is trustworthy. And finally, when we trust I'm sorry, when we live in the fear of the future, we doubt the plans of God. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, a very, very well-known and quoted verse, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now let's take a moment for just a second and consider the context, because this is a very commonly misunderstood verse. Without the proper context, we might be led to believe, like others have been, that God, that once we know God, only good will come to us, because that's what God wants, right? And so we won't, we shouldn't endure trials. And yet we don't see that in our lives. And so here's the context. This verse falls in the middle of Jeremiah's letter to the elders, priests, prophets, and the other people who have been carried off from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. So they are going into captivity. Many of the false prophets of the day were telling them to stir up trouble in their new home because God was going to use that to get them out of there. But Jeremiah says no. That is not God's plan. He wants his people to, quote, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord, and catch this, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. It is real easy to trust God's plans when things go smoothly. Yet when trials arise, how quick we are to pursue our own plans. In Jeremiah's day, the false prophets sought to bring change through their own man-made plans. But God sought to change the heart through his eternal plans. The same battle is still the one that resides in us today. Just as was the case for each of the three trees, the plan God had and the love he showed was far greater than they could have ever hoped. Even their greatest dreams and deepest fears of the future were focused on something not nearly as great or as deep as to what God had in mind. His plans for our lives are the same. His plans are always what's best and always the most fulfilling that we can live. Do you believe that? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. The best plans that we can come up with, we spend our lives laying out them in, in, a, in a way that gets us ahead, or attempts to. We scheme to try to get advantages for ourselves. We're always searching to make our life better out of our own strength and ability. But God's plan, or God says this, you need reconstructive heart surgery. You need a renovation of the heart. Look not to yourself, but instead lay your pride at the foot of the cross. Come and follow me, 
for my yoke is light. And Jeremiah, in verses 12 and 13, immediately following what I just read, he said, Then you will call on me, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so we remember that the fear of the future that we face, which goes back to the Garden of Eden, is a distrust of God. Let's pray.